Hello, I'm Matthew Emery Waller, and welcome to our continuing coverage of the unrest in Russia. Well, let's start straight away with that dramatic breaking news in a quite extraordinary day in Russia. The leader of the Wagner Group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, has ordered his mercenaries to turn around and return to their bases to avoid bloodshed, he said. A huge convoy had been heading towards Moscow in what Vladimir Putin had described as an attempted mutiny. Well, Prigozhin said his troops had advanced 200 kilometres towards the capital in just the last 24 hours. Well, in his nightly address, Vladimir Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, said that his counterpart in Russia was running scared. The man from the Kremlin is obviously very afraid and probably hiding somewhere, not showing himself. I am sure that he is no longer in Moscow. He knows what he is afraid of because he himself created this threat. Well, let's go straight to our World Affairs editor, John Simpson. And John, in an extraordinary day, another really dramatic twist. I, I think that nobody really anticipated this. Um, you have to wonder whatever argument uh, the the Belarusian president can have possibly used uh, to to Prigozhin to persuade him to change. I mean, bloodshed. Well, he says he's been claiming it's one of the reasons why he was advancing on Moscow. He's been uh, complaining that uh, Russian troops. The, the ordinary army of Russia has been firing on, on his men, the, the Wagner Group men, and killing them. That's why he wanted to uh, have it out with the, uh, the defence minister, Shoigu, and the head of the uh, armed forces, uh, Gerasimov. Face to face, he said. Unsurprisingly, they didn't go down to meet him. And so he decided he was going to go and, and meet them. Who knows? Um, it's really, really difficult to say. Maybe uh, Putin has promised that he'll sack the two of them. And um, that's a, a kind of a victory for, for, for Prigozhin. But as things stand, uh, not knowing anything more than just the basics that we know, I think this has to be quite a success for Vladimir Putin, his his stock must rise greatly as as a as a result of this. Yes, I mean there is so much we don't know that perhaps we'll get more detail in the coming hours in terms of what uh, uh, in terms of what prompted this about turn, this return to base. But uh, when you look at what has happened in the last 24 hours, uh, despite what you're just saying there about Vladimir Putin and the success in these last few moments, uh, there is enormous damage to him, presumably. Oh, enormous damage, and I mean, what a time! for the Ukrainian forces uh, to be able to see their enemy in such a disarray. I mean, the Ukrainians have made it absolutely clear that they've still got large reserves that they're planning to throw into their, uh, their big counteroffensive. It hasn't done as much as, as uh, Ukraine was hoping up to now, but from this point on, it has all those weapons that it's got from NATO countries, it is uh, able to move in and uh, find the weak spots, which it must already have identified, and uh, attack the, the Russian army uh, in, in, a, in a major way. And at this very moment, the small but m much more effective Wagner group is uh, in open conflict with the Russian army. Well, it was until about half an hour ago. And now where we are is still uncertain. But of course, the uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive will carry on, will go ahead. Um, and uh, yes, I mean, as you say, Putin has been badly damaged by the whole affair. John, stay with me. You're talking about the counteroffensive. Let me just tell you, in the last few moments, Ukraine announcing a new offensive on the Eastern Front. Their military saying their forces are advancing around Bakhmut and further. Uh, I'll come back to you, John, in a moment or two. But of course, so much focus on what we've heard from Evgeny Prigozhin just in the last half an hour, this about turn. Well, uh, I just want to play an English translation of that message in Russian. It was a voice message on his Telegram social media channel in the last hour. So let's just have a quick listen. 
They wanted to disband the Wagner. On June 23rd, we went out on a justice march. Within a day, we were just 200 kilometers away from Moscow. During that time, we did not spill a single drop of blood of our fighters. Now the moment has come when the blood can be spilled. Therefore, understanding all the responsibility for the fact that Russian blood will be spilled on one of the sides, we are turning our columns back and leaving in the opposite direction to the field camps according to the plan. Well, let me bring John back in. And John, as you were saying a little earlier, so much of his anger over recent days and weeks have been aimed at the defence minister, also the head of the army. It had never quite got to Bogosian against Putin directly, had it? Well, it didn't. But um, I think the, uh, I think you know, it was there all the time, and the name of Putin was sort of hovering in the, in the background. I, it's, it really is uh, very hard to think what President Lukashenko of, of Belarus kind of offered um, uh, to, to Prigozhin, must have offered it, must have offered it on uh, Putin's say-so. Um, but, I mean, it's not impossible, and we'll have to wait and see whether this actually happens, uh, that both uh, Shoigu, the Minister of Defence, and Gerasimov, the, the head of the armed forces, will now be sacked. It's hard to think of anything else big enough, really, uh, that would make uh, Prigozhin just say, OK, uh, no more blood to be spilled. I'm out of here. We're going back to our positions. John, for now, thanks once again. Let's go straight to the newsroom to our security correspondent, Frank Gardner. Frank, what is your assessment of what we've seen in the last 60 minutes or so? Well, I think you have to ask the question, is it all over for this man, Yevgeny Prigozhin? Because um, really by saying that he's turning his troops back, that's an admission of failure. Remember that he laid down his terms, which was he wasn't going to budge until the... Defence Minister Sergei Shoigu and the Chief of General Staff Valery Gerasimov came to, to meet him in Rostov-on-Don. That hasn't happened. Some junior officials or junior military officials did come to see him, but he didn't get what he wanted. So I would say that this is 1-0 to President Putin um, and that who, however that conversation went, the net result is that Prigozhin is backing down. I wouldn't want to put a lot of money on his political future right now because the fact is that he probably expected people to rise up and join him. That didn't happen. I very much doubt he had the full 25,000 troops that he talked about at his disposal. He, Wagner, yes, has those troops, but they're scattered around in different locations. And the FSB, the state security service, is not with this man, it's with President Putin, and so is the general armed forces of Russia. So Prigozhin was heavily outnumbered, he's overreached himself, um, there will now be some kind of negotiations, but remember there is an arrest warrant out for him. It's a tricky one, this, because the Wagner Group has been immensely useful to the Kremlin. Um, President Putin has been able to use them as a kind of arm's length doing the dirty work for them in places like Mali, Libya, Central African Republic, Mozambique, as well, of course, as Syria and the Donbass in, in Ukraine. So it's not really in Russia's interest to dismantle them. They are one of the most effective fighting forces on Russia's side. But I can't see how President Putin could ever again trust Yevgeny Prigozhin. It's rather like the owner of an attack dog, of a Rottweiler or of a, um, you know, a really um, tough dog that turns around and bites its owner. Um, so President Putin was visibly angry in that address that he gave earlier today when he, he talked about betrayal and a stab in the back. He's not somebody who's going to forgive this. I think Prig Prigozhin's military and political future must now be over. What does it say about Russian vulnerability, though, that uh, he was able to make the advances he made, as he says, 200 kilometers in just 24 hours? Deeply embarrassing. I mean, not only that, but the fact that he's able to cross the border um, and take Russian Southern District military headquarters in Rostov-on-Don without a shot being fired. Nobody opposed him. So you know, the fact is that even though Prigozhin looks like he's beaten in this, 
some of the things that he's been saying must resonate with a lot of Russians. Remember that he's been railing against what he calls the fat cats up in Moscow, the oligarchs, the people who managed to dodge sending their sons to the front. And he said, all the while, look at it, I'm surrounded by dead bodies. You don't care about them. All you care about is, is you know, YouTube videos for your sons and daughters and your nice parquet line datchers and so on. I mean, these are his words. Um, he's really been vitriolic about it. But most importantly, he has challenged in the last 24 hours President Putin's own narrative for starting this war. And that narrative, if you remember, was that, um, and the Kremlin has stuck to it, was that Russia had no choice but to invade Ukraine because Ukraine, backed by NATO, was going to be a threat to Russia. He said, that isn't true. This invasion was started in order to promote Sergei Shoigu from general to marshal and to enrich the pockets of the oligarchs. Those are his words. So, no, not everybody in Russia watches the Wagner's Telegram channel. Um, they tend to watch state television instead. So Putin still enjoys, I think, a large degree of support. But nevertheless, the genie is out of the bottle and somebody who has fought for Russia in the Donbass and scored them their only real victory in the last eight months is saying these things. Um, will he now be forced to retract them? Will he be put on television to say it's all been a terrible mistake? I don't know. The next 24 hours is going to be quite interesting. But for now, this mutiny, certainly the steam appears to have been taken out of it.